So with the female anatomy, we have both internal genitalia and external genitalia. So we're going to begin with internal. And the first one I want to introduce, or first organ, are the ovaries. And remember, the ovaries are the female gonads, which mean the gonads are the primary sex organs. They actually make the gametes. And the gametes are called ova, as you can see. That's the plural form of an ovum. So if we make one, we make an ovum. Many are ova. And this is the same thing as saying eggs, right? We typically say sperm and eggs. Ova are, are just a more proper term of it for eggs. So all the same thing. The ovaries also produce those sex hormones, as we talked about before, estrogen and progesterone. We'll talk more. We'll discuss it in this chapter and in the endocrine chapter about what those two hormones are specifically doing. And what the ovaries do is they basically mature these immature, premature eggs. So I'll show you a picture towards the end, but what we have are follicles, and follicles are just the immature eggs, and what they're called, are they start out as something called oocytes, and eventually what we're going to do is through hormones and through meiosis, we're going to mature them to an ovum. So as you can see, the number of eggs are predetermined at birth. Some folks are disputing that information. This is just what's recent in some textbooks, but there is some research saying that between ages zero and two and maybe even later, um, there's still some making or growing of, of these premature eggs. So um, th that's kind of up to debate. But you have millions and millions of them at birth, and then they start dying. They start shedding off or becoming non-functional. And as you can see, at puberty, there's only about a quarter million. And basically, once puberty happens, uh, the menstrual cycle will kick in. And once every month, give or take a week or so or two weeks, um, the female will ovulate. And that is their chance to become pregnant or have that egg or that ovum fertilized with the sperm cell so they can have a baby. So at this point, you may be asking yourself, well, how does the egg get from the ovary to the uterus, right? Because the uterus is where that fetus embryo baby is going to be hanging out and growing for those three trimesters, hopefully. And the answer to that are the fallopian tubes or this duct system. And you can see the fallopian tubes has uh, several names. They're also known as the uterine tubes. They're also known as the oviducts. And the job of the fallopian tubes is to receive an ovulated oocyte. Now, remember, an oocyte is still re referring to an immature egg. So it doesn't really actually mature mature. It doesn't become a technical ovum until a sperm really penetrates it in the fallopian tube. So let's talk about ovulation real quick. We'll, we'll talk about what causes ovulation later down the road. But ovulation is the releasing of this immature egg from the ovary. So it's that, I say releasing, that's kind of nice. It's more of a rupturing. And in some cases, it's severe enough uh, or it's um, drastic enough to where females can actually feel an ovulation once a month. And it's basically just a uh, lower quadrant pain, a uh, real sharp stabbing for a few seconds or like a popping sensation, and then it goes away. It's called middle schmerz, if, if any of you have ever experienced that pain before. It's interesting. So ovulation is the rupturing of this egg, leaving the ovary, and it kind of goes in this space, which is actually filled with peritoneal fluid, fluid from that peritoneal, that digestive area. So very important bullet point right here uh, no contact with the ovary so let me kind of draw you my representation of it you got your uterus here in green you got the fallopian tube so this one's gonna be cut off on the right side so let me draw a fallopian tube on the left a little fallopian tube and it's got these little finger looking things called fimbriae and then the ovaries sit kind of right next to that, but they're not actually touching. 
there is a space. So as that immature egg gets ovulated into the space, there's these little finger-looking things called fimbriae that actually move or swim them towards, swim these eggs towards the fallopian tube, and it kind of catches it and then brings it inside of it. So to help you with the, because I don't have this in the notes, fimbriae are the little fingers on the edges of the fallopian tubes. And they kind of work like cilia, if you will. They look like cilia, too. And they're just moving back and forth, trying to make this current. Basically, you dropped a, a tennis ball in the pond, and you're trying to move the water to get the tennis ball in, in to you so you don't have to jump in the water kind of analogy. That's what the fimbriae are doing. So, oh, sorry, I should have read ahead. It's right there, isn't it? My bad. Anyway, it doesn't hurt to spell things. So, once it's actually in the fallopian tube what happens is we have cilia ciliated cells inside the fallopian tube that actually also help move the egg closer to the uterus and we also have non ciliated cells that produce secretions to keep everything healthy and nourished these secretions have a lot of important nutrients now as you can see here the oocyte and the sperm this is where they meet. So this is where fertilization takes place. So what is fertilization? That is where the sperm actually interacts with the egg. And so many people think this happens in the uterus. So many people think this happens in the ovary. It does not. Where the sperm actually meets up with the egg is in the fallopian tube. So here's your little sperm guys with their acrosome head and their mid body and their tail and they make their way and they meet the egg inside of the fallopian tube. So this is the site of fertilization. Here we have a nice picture of the female reproductive anatomy. Let's focus on the top image first and then we'll work our way down. So this top image is a lateral view. We're looking at the side. Basically, we did a mid-sagittal cut. We cut the body in half from basically head down. And now, and we just turned it. So we're looking at the lateral midline, if you will, of the female body. So first off, I want to show you that this is the bladder, B for bladder, right here. So therefore, the urethra would be kind of that black line I just showed you. The uterus is the structure that's colored in red that you can see. And behind the uterus, I'll put an R here, this is your rectum and your anal canal. So the uterus is wedged between the female urinary system and the female digestive system. And then here behind the rectum, obviously, you can see the vertebrae. Here you got your, your L4, your L5, your sacrum, coccyx down here, all that stuff. So that's just a little orientation of the female anatomy from the lateral view. If you look at the anterior view here, you can see a little bit more information. Uh, this tube that I am coloring in green right there, that is the vagina or the vaginal canal. And then the cervix is this small, small opening that kind of connects the vagina to the uterus. And the uterus will be right here in purple. So, I mean, essentially it's all one tube. Uh, but, but they are isolated, right? Um, the cervix needs to stay closed um, while the baby is growing, right? You don't want to be three centimeters dilated in the middle of your pregnancy, right? You want, you want to have that baby kind of tucked in and hidden inside the uterus. So then as we go from the uterus, you can see, we'll do this in, uh, in red, these tubes that actually stretch from or laterally from the uterus and then they kind of wrap around and they interact with that ovary. Once again, though, they don't touch. Uh, not the best picture because in that picture it kind of does look like they're touching. The ovaries are those little blue nuggets. But there is a space between them and that's where those fimbriae, those finger-looking things, actually come into play. We've discussed the ovaries and the fallopian tubes. Now let's move on to the uterus. The uterus is a very thick muscular organ. And this is involuntary muscle. This is smooth muscle. And we'll talk about the layers in just a moment. 
and a couple functions for the uterus. One, it's to retain that fertilized ovum. It's the, once again, this is and retain and receive basically the same thing, grabbing onto it and then holding onto it and nourishing that fertilized ovum. So ovum, once again, that is the mature egg that that eventually, sh if it's fertilized by a sperm, um, it will eventually have to be nourished and taken care of to grow into a baby. Now, if it's not fertilized by a sperm, it will continue this process down the fallopian tube into the uterus, and eventually it'll just be shed with the menstrual cycle. So there are three layers to this organ. And once again, it kind of has this, uh, that's not the best drawing, kind of has this triangular shape to it. And then the fallopian tubes connect up top. And the outside layer, the very outside, is the perimetrium, a lot of just tough tissues, there's collagen fibers that protect this area. Then we have the smooth muscle layer, that's the myometrium. So what we're doing here is we're going superficial to deep. And myo meaning muscle, right? And once again, smooth muscle, so this is involuntary. And this contracts mainly during... Uh, child labor, you know, childbirth, spitting the baby out, uh, but it also contracts during orgasm for the female, and it also contracts just a little bit during the menstrual cycle. Now, generally, to my knowledge, females can't really feel that. Um, yes, when you have those cramps, that is the smooth muscle, you, you know, locking down, and obviously, you can have some radiating pain into the back and other areas of the pelvis. Um, but there are very minor, minute contractions of that smooth muscle to actually propel the next layer, the endometrium, oh, out, out of the body, right down the vaginal canal so it can leave the body. So many different ways that the myometrium do contract. And the endometrium, as I just mentioned, that's the mucosal lining. And this is going to be very, very important for the baby. It, it's going to have to... Uh, grow a lot of blood vessels, a lot of arteries are going to grow in this area to give nutrients to the baby, or at this point, you know, embryo fetus. But it also changes on a monthly cycle. So if you're not pregnant, those arteries change and they actually shrivel up and die and then you build new ones every single month. So the endometrium, this is the lining that is shed. This is the stuff that comes out in the monthly cycle for the female. And you just make new, you build up new endometrium after that. And it's just a constant cycle until menopause, that is. So just another illustration. I know that we've already discussed this, but just to give you another picture of, of what we're talking about, you can see the vagina, the vaginal canal, and then once again, the cervix is just kind of this connection point. And then the uterus is just this kind of triangular looking structure right here in black. And then the fallopian tubes. And a little better illustration, you can see that the fimbriae aren't really touching the ovary. Maybe that top one is, but it shouldn't be. And just another lateral view for you to review. Once again, the uterus is wedged between the bladder and the rectum. So then... This structure right here in black, that would be the vaginal canal. So one thing that, that always amazes me, I used to have a test question that, that said, you know, how many how many holes, how many openings are in the female perineum, or basically the, the private parts of a female. And uh, more commonly, females miss this question more than guys do. Uh, you have three holes. There's three openings. You have the opening to the bladder, the urethra, right? That's where the urine comes out. You have the opening to the vagina, that's where the baby or the menstrual blood comes out, and then of course you have the anal canal where the waste comes out. So there are three openings, even though the urethra and the vaginal opening are somewhat close together, they are different openings, they're different orifices. Next we have the vagina or the vaginal canal, also known as the birth canal. Two main functions to the vagina, number one, is this is where the baby comes out in a natural birth, right? And number two, this is where the non-baby comes out. If you aren't pregnant that month, there will generally be the endometrial shedding, also known as the menstrual flow.
And I guess we can put a third function too. This is also a passageway for the delivery of sperm, right? The only way to get pregnant is to have sperm go through the vagina so it can get to the uterus, to the fallopian tubes. So we can, we can add that in if you want. Um, there, as I mentioned before, with, with the semen, all, all those ninja factors, there is bacteria. There's actually a lot of bacteria in the vaginal canal. That is normal. That is natural, just like we have bacteria in our small and our large intestine. That is normal. And generally speaking, that bacteria makes the vaginal canal a little acidic. Once again, keeps the vagina healthy, as you can see, free from infections. So that is normal. And also, and that's one of the other reasons why, once again, the sperm or the semen, excuse me, has to be alkaline. So the acidity of the vaginal canal don't kill that sperm. So we've talked about the internal genitalia. Let's move on to the external genitalia. And another way of saying external genitalia for the female is called the vulva. These two words or terms are interchangeable. So vulva means external genitalia. And then everything underneath this, so the mons pubis, the labia, the vestibule, that's all part of the vulva. So all of these things are the vulva. So the mons pubis, this is just that kind of fatty pad area right in front of the pubic bone area. Um, it's where pubic hair will start once puberty hits for the female. And it just serves as an area for protection. Some articles say that it actually can um, serve as an area for pheromones um, for sexual attraction. Um, some folks agree with that. Some folks disagree. I, I, I don't know. But it's just that kind of fatty pad area. And then we have the labia, and labia just means lips. So we have the labia majora, and the labia majora is basically the skin folds. So I'll put fat here and skin here. And it actually is skin. It, it, I mean, it looks like skin, feels like skin. Inside or deep to the labia majora is the labia minora. So the labia majora kind of enclose the minora. And this is not skin. This is more similar to the vaginal urethral tissue. And this is actually enclosing the, the vestibule area or is part of the vestibule. So this is actually what's protecting the genitals. So once again, labia means lips. So it's the lips that actually enclose the genitals. Now, our next term is the vestibule. The vestibule is more just an area. It's not an actual structure like these other three. It's just a region where the opening to the urethra and the vagina are. So it's just kind of this area where we have these two openings, these orifices. And then also around the vaginal canal, we have these vestibular glands. And what their job is is to secrete mucus to basically provide lubrication. So as the female is engaging in intercourse, um, it, it can continue as these glands secrete. And there's all sorts of different glands. Uh, Bartolin's glands are the more popular ones that, that generally are, um, are tested on in lab environments. And I'm kind of blanking on some of the other ones, but um, th there's several groups of glands in that area that secrete mucus for lubrication. And then last but not least, we have the clitoris, or some people pronounce it clitoris. And this is the erectile tissue. So this is a little anterior uh, to, to the, both the vaginal canal and the urethra, believe it or not. And this is, once again, believe it or not, very, this is synonymous to the male penis. It's actually the same tissue. So this can actually get engorged with blood and become erect, just like the male penis, um, where it, it, if without the engorgement of blood, it's flaccid or what they call, they, people say limp, right? Um, if it's erect, it's just full of blood. And it's the same thing with the clitoris. And what we'll learn at the end of the chapter is it actually is the same tissue. Um, pretty, pretty crazy. So that is the vulva. So to give you a picture of the vulva external genitalia, we can identify certain structures here. So let's just, uh, let's work from top to bottom with the words. The prepuce here, I didn't mention that. This is just kind of the, the hood or the little protective area over the clitoris. And you can see the clitoris is this area right here. So we have 
let me circle the urethra and the, and the vaginal opening. So the urethra is here in purple. That's where the urine comes out. And then in red is the vaginal opening. There we go. So very anterior. So, so we're, we're looking at this picture. Um, the female is on her back. So this would be anterior and this would be posterior towards the anal canal. So the clitoris is anterior to both openings and protecting all this, protecting all of this vestibule area. So what the vestibule is, once again, we'll do this in green. The vestibule is not really a thing. It's just kind of a region that has the urethra and the vagina in there and also kind of borders that clitoris area. You can make the argument right here too. So all this in green is considered the vestibule. And what encloses the vestibule are the deeper lips, and we call those the labia minora. So that would be these structures right here that I'm highlighting in black. And then the labia majora just goes around them, enclosing them, and that actually is skin. It's the skin fold, so you can see it right here in purple, labia majora, also right here. And then I already pointed out the urethra and the vaginal canal, and you can see some of the glands. If you look at the picture on the right, basically what we did was we just kind of went a little deeper and removed the outer skin structures. And you can see the vaginal canal here with a star, purple star. And we have these glands right next to the vaginal canal. These are those vestibular glands that I mentioned. And that's what's going to help provide the lubrication for that area. Um, other things to just point out to you, the corpus cavernosum, this is, once again, uh, this is very similar tissue. The, the gland, I mean, take a look at what the clitoris looks like without removing the skin and deeper tissues. It kind of looks like a penis, right? And it actually is the same type of tissue. It's erectile tissue, and it's the same, same you, you should have seen this term, uh, cavernosum, in the male section as well. Um, it's just the area where arteries fill up with blood. So it's very, very similar. We're not, we are different, but we're not all that different, males and females. And another tissue that can be considered external genitalia are the breast tissues in females. So the purpose of the breast tissue is, in a female, is to develop the appropriate glands to produce milk for the newborn so we can breastfeed right now if you take a look at this the bottom bullet or little dash mark thing they are present in both males and females these mammary glands that are able to produce milk guys have them too they're just very very underdeveloped because this is dictated by a hormone so females um, do develop the breast tissue and it's really most breast tissue is just fatty tissue as you can see um, it's mainly just adipose and then it's got all these kind of lobules and columns where the milk is formed and then eventually secreted through the areola and nipple area specifically. Uh, but guys actually, believe it or not, do have the same anatomy. It's just with the female hormones, specifically progesterone and estrogen, but they start growing during puberty and then they grow even more during pregnancy uh, because you have this buildup of uh, these lobules and these ducts maturing and making more milk. So it's really just a hormonal thing that controls um, how many of these glands and how active they are. So we discussed spermatogenesis in the male. Let's talk about oogenesis in the female. So this is the developing of those eggs. And what you'll find out is it's very similar to how, how the sperm developed. Uh, I'll, sh I'll have an illustration or a picture on the next slide, but let's talk about it first. So once again, before birth, um, the, these eggs, uh, they're not quite ova yet or ovums, but um, this production begins and you have uh, millions of them, several million. But remember by puberty, I'll just put P for puberty. Oh, there we go. Uh, we only have about a quarter million left. So yes, we have millions and millions and millions, but only the strongest survive. And the strongest are about a quarter million. Now, once that starts, um, several of these potential eggs, these oocytes, once again, an oocyte is an immature egg, they're released each month with, with that ovulatory cycle. And we're going to talk about 
uh, the details. We're going to get day one, day 14, day 28. We're going to talk about the 28-day cycle of the female ovulatory and menstrual cycle in just a little bit. Just hang with me. So out of all of these O sites that are released each month, as you can see, only one usually enters meiosis one. So the other ones just kind of just break down and never make it, and they're going to be um, either recycled or you know disintegrated, or they're going to uh, be shed in the menstrual cycle. So what happens is the egg going through meiosis one, uh, what we're going to end up doing, remember meiosis is basically mitosis twice, so we get two like that. And then if we were to do meiosis two, we would eventually end up with four cells, right? We'd have two, three, four. And they would be four genetically different cells. Remember, we had the four sperm and they're all different. Why brothers and sisters are different. So here's what happens. And the female is only one of these several oocytes go through meiosis one and one out of these two results so we have two cells right here, or two immature eggs. They are genetically different, and only one of them is going to survive. One of them is stronger. And I actually, I didn't draw this on purpose, but it kind of worked out that way. You can see that the one on the right is a little bigger, and that's kind of how it works. Whoever has the most cytoplasm as they split, that is what the body's going to choose to be the strongest. They have the, the best capability of being a very good healthy egg to make a big good healthy baby so what's going to happen is this smaller one is going to turn into something called a polar body and a polar body is basically an immature egg doomed for cell program death uh, it will eventually split into two uh, cells um, but basically these two cells are going to not make it they're not going to be chosen for ovulation they are not, not nothing's going to happen to them so they're just kind of irrelevant regarding fertilization making a baby so this one that made this um that made it that that is the chosen one if you will for this monthly ovulation cycle um it pauses halfway through meiosis so remember there are four phases to mitosis meiosis right we have prophase metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. And what happens is this immature egg pauses in metaphase two. And why did I say immature? Remember, it's still an oocyte. It's still immature. It doesn't really become mature until sperm penetrates it. So what happens if we are not sexually active or we're using some type of birth control or we're just, um, we're not getting pregnant for some reason what happens is that secondary oocyte just breaks down deteriorates and it will just be either recycled or shed out in the menstrual cycle if penetrated however if a sperm penetrates it then it will complete the rest of meiosis too it will go through anaphase it will go through telophase and eventually it will produce one large mature egg and then that's, of course, the sperm going to interact with it. Fertilization takes place in that fallopian tube, and we start growing that baby. Let's move on to the next slide, and I'll show you how this actually looks. So you can see here it starts with a diploid cell, or that 2N that we talked about with the guy. And they go through mitosis, and this is all before birth. So that remember, there's 7 million of these that are basically at birth. You have a lot of these... Uh, potential egg cells but most of them eh, about 80 90 percent of them die and you only have about a quarter million by puberty so 250k and what happens is every single month um, several of these potential eggs gets get them um, stimulated and start growing and once again we have this split and only one is going to be chosen so the secondary oocyte, this was the biggest and strongest. Once again, compared to the size of this guy, this first polar body, not that big, doesn't have that much cytoplasm. So they are going to split, and then they're eventually just going to be uh, destroyed, if you will. And then basically it just stops. It stays in this area, 
and then if sperm penetrates, it will continue that process and become a mature ovum. It will go through the rest of meiosis too. And once again, so you see, you see another split here. This one will be disregarded as well, and we only got the biggest, best, strongest mature egg for the sperm to make the best, healthiest baby. So very similar um, to, to the guy. The, the difference is the guy doesn't have really these polar bodies. All sperm are capable of impregnating a female, where in the female we only have one egg and multiple sperm, right? So all of these other potential eggs are going to be um, destroyed, so we, ha we only sh basically give our, give our best chance. So every month you are ovulating the body's best egg, so to speak. All right, y'all, we're about to get a little intense here. So what we're going to talk about over the next several slides is something called the ovarian cycle. And the ovarian cycle is a 28-day cycle. And during this 28 days, there are a lot of changes happening. Basically, we have a pre-ovulatory phase. We have an ovulation episode. And then we kind of have a post-ovulatory phase. Now, this is happening at the exact same time as other things going on in the female reproductive system. And what we call that is the menstrual cycle, also known as the uterine cycle. Okay, so I'm, I'm just going to put this here for now and then I'm going to erase it. But there is a, an ovarian cycle that has these three phases in it. One two, three, and then there's the menstrual cycle, which happens during the same 28 day period. But the menstrual cycle is also going to have three of its unique things going on different from these phases. If that's confusing, don't worry, don't panic. I'm going to show you a slide on the, or a picture, excuse me, on the next slide, and we're going to bring this all together. But there are two overlapping phenomenons or occurrences happening during this 28 day cycle. So the ovarian cycle is dealing with what's going on in the ovary and the menstrual cycle is what's going on in the uterus. Okay. The ovary and the uterus, two different organs, but they are both reproductive organs. So they're going to be influenced by the hormones, right? The endocrine system. So let me repeat that again. The ovarian cycle lasts 28 days and it talks about what's happening with the ovaries, the menstrual cycle, uh, or the, the uterine cycle happens over the same 28 days. And that's just talking about the changes happening inside the uterus. Okay. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to erase this menstrual cycle and we're going to talk about the ovarian only on this slide. Now, all of your textbooks, use this 28 day cycle that that's like the gold standard uh, as, as we know as females know and some guys know 28 days unless you're on just like a stellar birth control um, 28 days is absolutely not true for the majority of the population um, this can range anywhere from 28 days plus or minus a week and some folks this takes two weeks uh, longer than 28 days some folks are on a 40 day cycle so not everybody gets a period or a menstrual uh, or menses is what they call it every single four weeks on the exact same day of the calendar that just doesn't happen um, usually it's hormone related and unless you've been in a laboratory or lived your whole life in a testing bubble uh, you're not going to be on a 28 day cycle every single month so when I'm telling you these days, you do need to know them, but for your own personal body or for your partners, if you're a guy, um, know that these are the average standard numbers, right? Um, if they say average blood pressure is 120 over 80, you're not going to be 120 over 80. That's the average. You're going to be higher than 120 over 80. You're going to be lower than 120 over 80. It's the same thing here. Okay, so ladies, some of you might be on a 26-day cycle. Some of you may be on 33 in January, 31 in February. You might be 26 in March and 38 in April. It, it just depends, okay? 
So with that said, let's talk about what is going on during the ovarian cycle. As I mentioned, there are uh, 28 days in the cycle. And smack dab in the middle, I'm going to start with ovulation. Ovulation occurs on day 14. So the time frame leading up to ovulation is called the follicle phase, also known as the follicular phase. And those are days 1 through 13. Or really 1 through 14. Uh, but let's... Yeah, eh, it's all right. Same thing. Uh, ovulation, once again, is kind of a really quick process. It only takes a couple of seconds. So 1 through 13, 1 through 14. Everything after ovulation is the luteal stage. So that'll be day 14, or we can say day 15 to make it easy. Days 15 through 28. And then this cycle starts over. So... Let's talk about what's happening during these three phases. First, the follicular phase or the follicle phase. What's happening is we are basically getting the immature egg, that oocyte, ready to ovulate. So we're, we're growing this. Now, as you can see in these notes, this might be a little confusing. Just hang with me. As you can see, this primordial follicle leads to a primary follicle, leads to a secondary follicle. All right. The majority of this happens well before the month it happens. A lot of this happens during before birth. Um, to be a, a little bit more specific, uh, each uh, what a follicle is is basically just this little pocket, and these things start forming in the fetus. Okay, so like before you're even born, your body is making these follicles, these pockets, and inside these pockets we have a lot of immature eggs. So um, what happens is from childhood through basically menopause, these primordial follicles generally just start progressing um, towards this primary follicle state. So some are a lot faster, some are obviously all the way, it takes to your 50s to, for this to happen. But there's this kind of constant progression from primordial to primary. And then same thing, some go to secondary and some just take their sweet time. Um, now, most of these are going to die, as we talked about before, right? Uh, right when you're born, you have about 7 million immature eggs, and then by the time you hit puberty, you only have 250,000, right? We, we've shared those numbers a few times now. So most of these die. Most of these just basically uh, dis disintegrate or break down and aren't really functional. So at puberty, when this ovarian cycle starts happening on a 28-day or plus or minus a week cycle, um, hormones change and that's what's really dictating puberty is your estrogen progesterone are you know uh, moving up and down in these kind of cyclic or ebb and flow rhythms and I'm gonna draw them for you in just a few minutes so under the control of these hormones what eventually happens is some of these secondary and late secondary follicles move to the vesicular follicle and the vesicular follicle is basically the uh, it's also known as a tertiary or the three you know primary secondary and then three tertiary um, this is kind of the last stage before we get to ovulation now once again though by the time it gets to the tertiary or vesicular follicle and ovulation there's only one winner that there's only one um, egg that's gonna be possibly fertilized here so with that said this follicle phase, this is happening before you're even born, but during days 1 through 13, some of these secondary follicles, and, and really this process is kind of sped up a little bit. Some of the primordials are moving to primary, primary is moving to secondary, and basically these follicles are just developing. Okay. Now, on day 14, what happens? is the release of that oocyte, that, that basically that immature egg that, that's gone through that first phase of meiosis, but, it, but it's paused, and it'll continue through meiosis too if it's fertilized by a sperm in the fallopian tube. So ovulation, day 14, and it marks the end of the follicle phase, start of the luteal phase. 
So now at this point, we have an immature egg, and hopefully those fimbriae from the fallopian tube kind of swung it towards the fallopian tube and grabbed onto it. So now we have an egg inside of the fallopian tube. I'll put FT for fallopian tube. Okay, from there, what's going to happen are the next two weeks called the luteal stage. All right, so here's what's happening during the luteal phase. That vesicular follicle that has been ovulated, kind of floating around in the fallopian tube now, um, has a bunch of cells, and these cells are going to form this endocrine structure called the corpus luteum. And as you can see on the last bullet point, the corpus luteum secretes two of those main sex hormones, progesterone and estrogen. Now, what these hormones are going to do inside of this uterus is get the uterus ready for pregnancy. Basically, we are planning on it. Remember, your body wants to get pregnant every month, ladies. That, that's, that's what your uterus and ovaries are for, is to make babies. Not to be insensitive or anything, but literally from a biological standpoint, that's what we're talking about here. Same thing with guys. The whole purpose of sperm is to fertilize an egg. So every single time a, a guy has sex, the sperm are trying to swim and find that egg. That, that's, what it, that's what's happening. So if impregnated, if fertilized, this corpus luteum is going to serve kind of like a pre as a pre placenta and secrete a lot of these sex hormones to make sure the uterus is nice and thick and cozy for that nice uh, embryo fetus to start developing and if we aren't pregnant what's going to happen is it's going to start breaking down and it turns into this kind of scar looking structure called the corpus albicans but that's what's happening during this 28 day cycle all right so we have days 1 through 13, or 1 through 14, the follicles are being matured. Ovulation, the, follicle, the, the, the winner for the month, is released into the fallopian tube. And days 15 through 28 is we are basically getting ready for pregnancy. And then... If we are pregnant, this corpus luteum will continue to secrete these hormones until the placenta takes over. If we're not pregnant, this all falls apart and we start right back where we left, where we began at day one. So day 28 just goes to a new day one and we start the follicle phase all over again. And ladies, you do this every single month from puberty to menopause. Once again, the 28 days, give or take, everybody's a little different. All right. So one more thing I want to add here is based on what I'm telling you, check it out. Ovulation occurs at day 14. So that's when the egg is released into the fallopian tube or hopefully into the fallopian tube. And you've seen in movies and stuff, right, when, when pa uh, parents or folks are trying to get pregnant, the, the lady says, hey, I'm ovulating. You know, let's let's try to make a baby, right? And, and that is the sweet spot, you know, day 14. That, that's w when you want to do it. So if you can only get pregnant once a month, one day out of the month, excuse me, how do we have so many um, pregnancies that were unexpected? And the answer to that is, well, you can get pregnant more than one day of the month. Because, remember sperm, remember all those ninja factors, right? All those clotting factors and prostaglandins and enzymes, right? Guess how long sperm can live inside of the female reproductive tract? Sperm can live inside the female reproductive tract about five days. Now remember, millions and millions of sperm being secreted only takes a few. I'm trying, I'm, that's supposed to say days, sorry. A, days, struggling. So, yes, ovulation occurs during day 14, but if the female were to, was to have intercourse and have sperm enter the reproductive tract four or five days before that, sperm can be available. So we went from one day being able to get pregnant to possibly four or five. Um, so that, that's kind of how that happens. So... 
Uh, we're going to talk about the menstrual cycle and the menses and how you can kind of sort of time that based on your cycle. But once again, everybody is a little different. So let's move on to the next page. I'm going to show this to you in a picture format. And we're also going to bring in the menstrual slash uterine cycle. Okay, so on this picture, we're bringing it all together. Once again, two different cycles, but they're happening on the same calendar. We're just ovarian cycles happening in the ovaries. Menstrual cycle is happening in the uterus. So as you can see, just based on the title, uh, here's the, the menstrual cycle. And then down here in the picture, you can see it's called the uterine cycle. I did that on purpose because I want you to know that these are the same thing. Okay, menstrual cycle slash uterine cycle, same thing. So on the top of the page, let's talk about uh, the ovarian cycle. We're going to review this. You can see a 28-day calendar, and you can see the three phases we just talked about. Here's the follicular phase. starts in day one, and it goes all the way to day 13, 14. Then we have ovulation. Ovulation is on that day 14. And you can see what it is. Once again, it's the ovary actually kind of rupturing that uh, ovum that, well, it's actually still an oocyte at that point, but still uh, that, that egg, potential egg to, to be fertilized. And then days 15 or 14 and a half all the way through 28 is that luteal phase. And here you can see a picture, a representation of that corpus luteum. And it's just a big, literally it's just a big gland that secretes those sex hormones and but as you can see if we don't get pregnant it gets smaller and smaller and smaller and eventually just degrades and kind of gets recycled and disintegrates so that is what's happening during the ovarian cycle we're developing follicles we ovulate and then we're getting ready for pregnancy once again if all this falls apart guess what your body wants to do it again every single month the female reproductive system wants to get pregnant Let's move on to the menstrual and the uterine cycle. Now, what I'm going to do is we're going to talk about the same 28-day calendar. This stuff is happening at the same time. Now we're just moving on to the uterus. We have three phases as well with the menstrual uterine cycle. And you can see the three phases at the bottom here. We have the what we call menses. This is the actual active bleeding of the uterus into the vaginal canal and it comes out of the body and then we have the proliferative phase and then we have the secretory phase all right let's talk about the time frame for all of these the menses happens on days one through five now, once again, females, before you yell at me or throw something at me, this is the average of averages. Some females only bleed three days. Some can bleed a week over a week. It just depends. Everybody's a little different, right? They make all sorts of different tampons for different sizes and needs and, and blood flow and everything. It's all different. But generally speaking, average of average females, it's about a five-day period, um, literally. No, no pun intended there. The proliferative phase occurs from days five or six, whenever the menses is done, to day 14. So notice the end of the proliferative phase, proliferative, happens right at ovulation. So we can also make the uh, observation that menses is happening during the follicular phase, as is the proliferative phase once again it's just one's comparing what's happening in the ovaries the other one's talking about what's happening in the uterus and then the secretory phase happens the rest of the way days 15 through 28 and notice that's the exact same time frame as our luteal phase up here in the ovarian cycle Okay, so let's talk about what's happening during these three phases in the uterus and, and cervix vaginal area. So a lot of folks, a lot of books don't like putting menses at day one, uh, you know, starting the, the cycle at day one. So if, if you look this up online, some, of, some stuff may be different, but most textbooks have it this way. All right, days one through five, 
what's happening is that endometrium, that inner lining of the uterus, is shedding, and we are actively bleeding. And the reason why this is happening is it's kind of the chicken before the egg thing. The reason why this is happening is if you follow my red arrow here, it's because we didn't get pregnant on last month's cycle. So because we're not pregnant, we need to shed all that tissue that we build up, and we're going to start it all over, and we're going to just start from scratch, start brand new, and try to get pregnant again. So all of that lining from last month gets shedded. Now, after day five, or you know, give or take a day or two, whatever, for, for the menstrual period to begin, to, to end, we start the proliferative phase. And what's happening during the proliferative phase is we are building new endometrial tissue. So you can see in this picture here, the uterus is naked, there's no pink, there's no extra tissue. And then by the time we get to ovulation, you can see there's some pink tissue here. So we're building the thickness of that endometrial lining. We're not touching the myometrium. Remember the myometrium is muscle, that, that's there. The muscle doesn't change. It's the lining on the inside is what's changing every month. Uh, okay, so how, what we're doing to build this tissue is we actually grow arteries, or the females. You actually grow arteries and a lot of veins, and basically the more blood flow to that area, the, the more tissue you can build. Now, a really cool telltale sign of uh, the cycle is during this time, as we're building all of these arteries and veins, the cervical mucus gets really, really thick, and that can actually pour out into the vaginal canal. So a lot of times throughout the monthly cycle, um, sometimes females don't have very, very thick mucus uh, in, in the vagina, and sometimes it's very, very thick. Um, and, and, and ra rather sticky, and that is normal, that, that happens on a monthly cycle. It's during this day five through 14 area where it becomes very, very thick. And by the time we get towards ovulation, that's when it thins. And that thinning basically allows it to be easier for the sperm to do their thing and, and get into the uterus. So ladies, if, if you're trying to get pregnant and you're doing, you know, kind of like a natural clock thing, uh, one of the ways they do that, I mean, there's several different ways, temperature readings and all that stuff, but just the consistency of the mucus in the cervix area is also a, a very big go-to or common go-to. All right, so proliferative phase, we're making more tissue. And then the secretory phase, we're going to continue making that new tissue. But what we're doing at this point is the arteries are basically fully formed. And we're going to kind of convert that to these glands. And these glands are just going to spit out a lot of nutrients, basically a lot of glycogen, which will be you know eventually used as glucose, a lot of sugar. And what, what they call this sometimes is uterine milk. And basically it's to flood that potential embryo, that fetus, I, I keep saying them backwards, the embryo first and then fetus, um, the embryo with a whole bunch of nutrients. So just in case we're pregnant, we're going to have a lot of tissue on the inside of the uterus here in the secretory phase that I'm drawing on. We're going to have a lot of tissue, keep it nice and warm, but we're also going to flood it with a bunch of nutrients so it can grow big and strong and do its thing. Okay, but guess what? What happens if we don't get pregnant? Well, if we don't get pregnant, there's nothing to nourish. There's nothing to give all this uh, nutrient tissue to. So we have to shed it. So we're going to get rid of all of it. The blood flow starts breaking down because remember, we converted a lot of those arteries to these glands. Or they're basically, there's this kind of this conversion phase where they. Um, instead of blood flow, they kind of convert to this mucosa-like tissue. So now that we don't have proper blood flow to the area, well, guess what? We're going to start it all over again and go back to the beginning, and we're going to shed it all, bleed it all out for five days or so, give or take, one, two, three days, and then we're going to do the whole thing again. So these phases all overlap. It's all on the same calendar. Once again, we're just talking about what's happening in the uterus, and once happening in the ovary. Now, that's a lot of information. I, I just talked for a, a good 20, 25 minutes on these last two slides, 
if if, uh, if I went too fast or something's not clicking, I'd encourage you to rewind the video, look back at this, because now what we're going to do is on the next three slides, I'm going to assume that you understand this clock, this calendar, and we're going to talk about hormones and hormonal changes, what's happening from an endocrine standpoint that causes this, right? So, for example, what's causing this follicle gets bigger, 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 and then what causes it to burst? Well, it's a hormone. What causes um, you, you to have this uh, tissue build up, build up, build up, and then we start converting it to something completely different? It's hormones, okay? Uh, what causes this uh, corpus luteum thing to release stuff? Hormones. So make sure you understand this, these two cycles, the ovarian and the menstrual cycles, and then we'll move on and talk about the hormone control on the next three slides. All right, everyone, let's see how this goes. I'm going to do my best to describe what's happening with estrogen and progesterone first, and then we're going to talk about a couple of pituitary hormones and bring this all together. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to attempt to draw you a graph. Now I'm doing this with a very, very finicky mouse. So forgive me. I mean, y'all are pretty used to my handwriting by now, but that's actually not bad. Okay. So on this Y axis, we're just going to have levels of hormone. So I'll put L V L S. And this is a uh, high levels of hormone. And this is low levels of hormone in throughout the blood stream throughout the body. So we're going to introduce two hormones in just a moment. And then down here, we're going to have the time. So this will be day one. We'll have day 14 kind of in the middle here. And we'll have day 28 right here. Now what I'm also going to do, so remember we have the follicular phase in days 1 through 14. Then we have ovulation, day 14. And we have the luteal phase, 15 through 28 in the ovarian cycle. But I also want to include the menstrual cycle. So what I'm going to do, remember the menstrual cycle, the first five days are the menses, the bleeding. So I'm going to put a five right there. So just give it, give us some landmarks. Okay. So first hormone that I'm going to talk about is estrogen. So I'm going to put E is blue. So I'm going to put E star just well, how about this? Let's just do this. Estrogen will be in blue. And let's do progesterone in green. Or uh, let's do black, I guess. Progesterone will be in black. Okay, so here's how estrogen works. At the very beginning, first few days, estrogen is kind of flatlined, not really doing anything. But after the menstrual cycle is completed, kind of after that day five, day six, estrogen starts climbing. And it climbs and it climbs and it climbs and it climbs. And it kind of hits this peak right at day 14. And then what, it's, what it does is it starts kind of going down, going down, going down. And it'll go through a little like kind of bump in the road, a little cycle change. And then it kind of just evens out. And if you notice... Where it's at right here at day 28 matches kind of where it's at at day one, right? And maybe I can make that a little better, but it should be pretty even. So we just start a new month and we start where we left off. Okay, so that's the flow of estrogen. Now in black, I'll do progesterone. And progesterone kind of is just a little delayed. Progesterone is basically flatlined really, really low all the way to ovulation, until ovulation, and then it gets this huge spike. And then it kind of plateaus. And then we have one or two options here. If we are pregnant, this progesterone level will stay high due to that corpus luteum. It will continue to secrete high progesterone levels to develop the uterus to make sure that the embryo is healthy and it turns into a healthy baby nine months later if we are not pregnant the body knows by this day 21 to 22 mark right um it this will just plummet this will just go straight back down to almost zero 
and then start over at day one as you can see it'll just kind of be at the same uh, plateau so notice when these two hormones spike that's very very important estrogen spikes right after menses whoops i tried to do blue sorry there we go so after that five that day five once the menstrual period the menses the bleeding is done it will start spiking pretty much until we hit ovulation progesterone doesn't start increasing until ovulation and then what happens is it kind of plummets if it's not if we're not pregnant so no prego no p r but i'll just put preg if we're not pregnant it's going to plummet and that's going to happen all 28 day cycles so this will happen in march april may june july for the most part on a somewhat 28 day give or take a week or so cycle so that's what's happening here now what we're going to do on the next slide is we are going to introduce the pituitary hormones and talk about how estrogen and progesterone and vice versa they're related with these hormones okay everyone so on this slide i kind of jumped ahead uh, and just drew it out for you so it's the same graph same 28 day calendar instead of showing you the estrogen and the progesterone however i'm showing you two pituitary gland hormones so remember the pituitary gland is a gland that is connected to the hypothalamus and it's going to be in charge of releasing a lot of different hormones now these two specific hormones are in the what we call the anterior pituitary gland and i have them written out for you in green is what we call LH and that stands for luteinizing hormone some people pronounce it luteinizing that's how I was taught actually but as I've aged I've, I've started saying luteinizing because I've heard it a lot uh, and in purple we have FSH which stands for follicle stimulating hormone so follicle stimulating hormone and what do you think that does stimulates that follicle growth right that prim primordial follicle primary follicle secondary vesicular etc all right so let's take a look at what's happening with these two hormones now the good news is unlike estrogen and progesterone they're kind of taking the same route right they're kind of the same they're just mirror images of each other um it's just that luteinizing hormone generally has higher levels compared to the follicle stimulating so first things first notice that day one it's a little low and then it actually kind of starts climbing a little bit so basically at day one when the menstrual phase begins or the menses the bleeding begins right menstrual phase of the menstrual cycle um, both of these pituitary gland hormones start to rise a little bit they go up a little bit but not a lot and by day five remember that's when that estrogen started going up okay so hang with me here estrogen what i'm going to do is draw estrogen now in kind of a thick let's do let's do red eh, yeah red so remember estrogen kind of looked like this it was level 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 and then as soon as the period stopped it started shooting up like this right and it hit its peak its tip top at day 14. now that's important because as these estrogen levels rise that's going to cause the cascade or this domino effect of the lh and the fsh reaching that pinpoint top of the mountain mark on day 14. so this rising estrogen doesn't really have an effect on day 7 day 10 day 11. it's really right when it's getting to this kind of top of the mountain part this peak right it's once estrogen gets really really high then luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone uh, start spiking and now we know what happens on day 14 right 
day 14 is when ovulation occurs. So what is driving ovulation? What is causing that follicle to rupture? And it's this hormone. It's luteinizing hormone. Once luteinizing hormone hits this top of the notch or peak, this day 14 maximum, that's what causes ovulation. Okay. Now, is follicle stimulating hormone involved? Yes, of course. You see follicle stimulating hormone um, increasing as well. And if it's stimulated to the max, it can also, it's as mature as it's going to get inside the ovary. But the luteinizing hormone actually causes the rupturing part. Okay. And then as estrogen starts going down, right, remember after ovulation, to continue drawing that estrogen, it just started kind of going down a little bit as progesterone started rising, you notice that the LH and the FSH start going down as well. So unless estrogen is at that peak point, uh, FSH and LH kind of neutralize. Now, if we are pregnant though, this changes. This is assuming no pregnancy. So if we are pregnant, what's gonna happen is, I'll, I'll show you in the dotted lines, this luteinizing hormone is going to stay elevated. Now, maybe not that maximum, but it'll stay high because that corpus luteum will be secreting um, the estrogens and progesterones, and the LH is going to keep that thing going until other structures take over. Now, if we want to be really specific, it actually as as the pregnancy continues it actually isn't true lh it's a, something similar very similar to lh what it's actually called is uh, hcg and some of you may know this as the pregnancy hormone i think it's written like that it's capital c lowercase g my bad it's a uppercase g there we go and that stands for human uh chorionic gonadotropin uh, tropin once again that that's just an on off switch and it's affecting the gonads right so this is the pregnancy hormone so this is when generally speaking when you urinate on a stick uh, or your partner urinates on a stick to see if they're pregnant the two pink lines this is what that's detecting is, is this hormone or, or just doing a blood test uh, detecting this hormone so that's how the pituitary is involved now Remember, big picture here, what's happening is really everything except those days 12, days 13 through 15, it's all flatlined. It's that spike on day 14, especially from the LH, that's causing that ovulation to occur. Okay, so let's bring it all together. Nice summary page for you to study in case my uh, drawings weren't that great. And you'll see that this our textbook here um, will disagree with me a little bit, but for the most part, the flow is pretty spot on. And you'll see at top the summary of the f follicle maturation, right? Pr primordial to primary to secondary. And remember that a lot of them will die. This this word atresia right here at the top, that that's basically uh, cell death. So these things will break down and die and only one will be selected to become the winner while those other two polar bodies break down and die. So then we only have one uh, mature follicle and then it, that's the one that's going to be ovulated. So you can see it in the bottom picture kind of in yellow it's showing you everything that's happening all these graphs and all this stuff happening kind of overlapped. So you can see that the FSH and LH, um, I'm highlighting in red currently, if you can follow my marker, flatline, 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 and then right around day 14, I, I showed you on like day 13, it starts spiking, and then 14, it's the maximum. So this book disagrees with me a little bit, but if you read other textbooks, it will show you um, that the spike is on day 14, but either way, and then it plummets down if we're not pregnant. And then same thing on the bottom, you can see the estrogen that I'm gonna show you in purple, estrogen as soon as the bleeding stops it starts going up 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 it hits a peak i showed you a peak on day 14 this one's a little early and then it just kind of starts plummeting and going back down to normal and that agrees and then progesterone remember that was a straight flat line almost zero until ovulation and then it increases 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 and will continue to increase as long as we're pregnant if not 
it plummets, goes back down towards baseline zero. Uh, this one more picture I want to bring to your attention is the endometrial lining. Uh, and you can see the three phases here, the menses, the bleeding, days one through five. You can see the proliferative phase, days six through 14, and then the secretory phase, day 15 through 28. Once again, the tissue, we're losing tissue. You can see this kind of downward trend of tissue here in days one through five because we're bleeding. So we're actually getting rid of it. And then as soon as it's done, it starts building up. So you can see this kind of gradual increase from day six and day seven and day 12, and it goes all the way up to day 14. And then actually all those, and you can see these red things or these little squiggly things are arteries. Okay, we're actually growing blood ves vessels. And then once we get to like day 21, 22, these arteries are starting to convert to glands to nourish that possible baby. And if we're not pregnant, it's going to start breaking down a little bit, and we're going to shed it all again in next month's menstrual phase, menses. So just a nice little recap page to bring it all together for you. I'll clear this out so you can see what it looks like, and uh, make sure you understand these main concepts that we've been talking about. And with that said, we are ready to wrap up the female reproductive system couple more slides and then we'll call it a day. Regarding the female sexual response, it's going to be very similar to guys except for the ejaculation part. So the nervous system involvement is, is going to be similar. Uh, we're going to have uh, blood flow increases, right? We're going to have um, a lot of blood near that vaginal and, and clitoris area. We're gonna also going to have um, the breasts engorged with blood sometimes. Um, the, the nipples can tend to be a little bit more erect due to that blood flow. And we're also going to have those vestibular glands, those Bartholin's glands and those glands around the vaginal canal secreting mucus for lubrication. Now, a big difference between guys and gals is there is no latent period for ladies. So what a latent period is, is the break time, the rest. So if a guy and gal are getting together and they go through round one, when round one is done, the guy has to shut it down. Um, that there's, <laughs> there's a latent period or a waiting time, right? And if, if the guy is young, 16, 17, 18, whenever, I don't know, uh, it's not a very long period. It's, um, you know, maybe 10 minutes. Uh, but if, if, as the guy ages, that extensively gets a little longer. Females don't have that. Uh, females can actually experience multiple orgasms in one round of intercourse, of sex. So very, very different. Um, gals can, can orgasm multiple times. Now, a big thing, though, is orgasm is not required for reproduction, where in a guy, it kind of is. Uh, ejaculation and orgasms are, are synonymous with a guy. A uh, female may never orgasm, and she can definitely easily get pregnant. Uh, it has nothing to do with the ability to conceive. It's just the orgasm is the pleasurable part. That's the um, – or the, the climax part, excuse me. Hopefully, it's all pleasurable, but um, – the, the climax where the sympathetic nervous system takes over and you get the same thing. You can get the sweating, the dilated pupils, the, the goosebumps, all those things, the smooth muscle contraction of the uterus, all, all those um, types of feelings happens during an orgasm. Um, but that is not necessary for the female to get pregnant. next few slides we're going to work a little backwards uh, I didn't really mention puberty and the male uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to talk about menopause now and then on the next slide we'll talk about puberty for both males and females bring it all together as we wrap up this chapter so with menopause um, fertility in the female peaks in, in the late 20s and, and declines slowly until age 35 on average right all these numbers are averages of averages um, you can be 38, 39, 42 and still have a pregnancy, still have a baby. Um, it's just after age 35, they become a little more at-risk pregnancies is all. It doesn't mean you can't have them, just uh, you got to have a little bit more monitoring on um, 
different hormone levels and the, the, the baby and uh, blood pressure, all those kind of things. So as we get closer to our 40s and as we get closer to our 50s, generally uh, menopause or menopause-like symptoms start setting, setting in. And once, as you can see in the second bullet point, once a female has not had a period for 12 consecutive months, they are said to have completed menopause. Now this can happen over a long period of time. Um, you can you know, have spot, spot issues. Um, you can have a period once every quarter, once every six months. And even if you're at 10 months and if you have a period, you're still not in menopause. It has to be 12 consecutive months clinically to be in menopause. And, and this typically happens in around 50s generally. But some folks get it earlier, some folks get it later, just depends. And what happens during menopause, what causes menopause is estrogen and progesterone just plummet. They, they um, instead of raising like they do every 28 day cycle, they just kind of stay stagnant and they actually start lowering. And that causes an array of several different symptoms. And, and the main one, most of you have probably heard of this before, the main one is uh, hot flashes. And a hot flash can last a few minutes and basically uh, just out of nowhere just hits you like a brick and the, the female can just start sweating like crazy. Sometimes it's actually the opposite. Even though it's called a hot flash, they can get really cold and start shivering. Um, but generally speaking, they just get really, really hot, have to sit down, sometimes can become really uncomfortable and disoriented. Um, another thing with that decrease of estrogen mainly, I'm trying to find my mouse, there we go. Um, with the estrogen decrease, we talked about this last semester with the bone health, um, puts the female at great risk for decreased bone density, osteoporosis-like activity. So yes, it's important for guys to lift weights and do weight-bearing activities as we age. Way more important for females. Ladies, you have to get in the gym. You have to go on walks or jogs or something to put pressure on your skeleton, put pressure on your bones. Swimming is great, it's an awesome workout. You're not putting pressure on your skeleton though. The water's, you know, holding you up. Um, so make sure you're putting good, healthy pressure on your joints as you age. Very important for your skeletal health to avoid bad things, uh, broken hips and all those things that associate osteoporotic activity. Um, and that's really it. Let's, uh, let's move on to puberty. All right. So once again, I say puberty towards the end because puberty kind of works the same way with guys and gals from a hormonal standpoint, or at least the beginning hormones. And then obviously the secondary sexual characteristics is where it's really, really different. So looking at this chart, it's numbered. I'm basically, I'm essentially just going to read this to you, um, and just show you how this works. But depending on when puberty strikes, and generally speaking, it can happen um, age 8, 9, 10, 13, 15. It just depends, and I'll talk about that towards the end. Um, but what happens is this structure right here, this is the hypothalamus. So I'll just put HT for hypothalamus. And then this structure right here is the anterior pituitary gland. So I'm gonna put APG, anterior pituitary gland. And then obviously that white one behind it is the posterior pituitary gland. So what happens is once puberty begins, the hypothalamus starts releasing a hormone called gonadotropin releasing hormone, also known as GNRH. So it's gonado, is referring to the gonads, testes and ovaries. Tropic means to turn on or off and releasing, it's releasing it to go to the gonads. So once the hypothalamus releases this GNRH, GNRH, it gets sent from the hypothalamus to the anterior pituitary gland. And that tells the anterior pituitary gland to release its sex hormones or tropic hormones specifically. And we've already learned those. Those are both LH and FSH. Now, I've mentioned that in the female physiology, right? Um, 
LH is the ovulation, follicle stimulating hormones stimulating the follicles, but guess what? Guys have both hormones as well. LH helps with testosterone secretion, FSH helps with sperm making, sperm maturation. So LH and FSH are going to go to the guy's testicles, and as we saw in the previous slides, that they're also going to go to the male, or the female, excuse me, female ovaries. So once this starts happening, LH and FSH are going to start telling these sex hormones, sex glands, these gonads, to make sex hormones. So now we see the male testes start making testosterone and the female ovaries start making estrogen and progesterone. And that's really what starts all of all the puberty, all the sex characteristics and all the changes is the release of these hormones in large amounts for the first time ever. So, you know, going age zero to 10, female, um, you know, not very low estrogen levels, and all of a sudden you get this huge spike, and you can get all sorts of uh, things that occur. As you can read, uh, with the guys, uh, the penis starts growing, the scrotum starts growing, you start getting facial hair, the voice gets a little deeper, um, muscles start to get a lot bigger, even if they don't lift weights, they just grow. Uh, that's a big cool side effect of testosterone um start growing hair in other places other than the face armpit pubic area and um mood changes big time too um boys really love their moms growing up if, if, if they're fortunate to grow up with a mom and then as soon as puberty hits and the teenage uh, they can't stand their mom they're they're repulsed by them <laughs> um that a lot of that is just due to testosterone surges and then as it levelizes they hopefully can bring things back to normal. Um, female sex characteristics, uh, breasts start to develop. Uh, the voice can also change just a little bit. Uh, the hips get wider um, to, you know, for childbearing purposes. And also you'll get axillary hair, armpit, and then in the pubic area as well. And also mood swings, mood changes as well with estrogen and progesterone. Um, that's just part of these huge sex hormone swings. Now, what controls the age? Uh, some folks are early bloomers, some folks are late bloomers. Um, there, there's folks, uh, females, and could be in third grade, fourth grade, and they can start developing breast tissue. Some don't develop breast tissue until graduating from high school. It just depends. Uh, a lot of it's genetic. A lot of it's just you know what you were given gene-wise from your parents and your grandparents. You can't control it. Um, some of it's environmental. Um, and, and I won't get into the specifics of that. You can look into that. I don't want to start going down a rabbit hole, but uh, dietary nutrition wise can uh, play a big role. If you're exposed to certain chemicals that can trigger estrogen or estrogen block like um, effects. So that, that can trigger an early puberty in some situations. Um, so do your research there, but eventually hopefully everybody hits puberty and these Basically, you're becoming a uh, an adult <laughs> is what's essentially happening, and all that's causing this is just the change in hormones. Okay, so we've talked about male anatomy and physiology. We've talked about female anatomy and physiology. The last two topics we're going to discuss in this chapter is sexual determination and sexual differentiation based on that determination. So we all have 46 chromosomes, right? We've talked about that, hopefully. So there, there are some cases where folks could be missing one or having an extra one, unfortunately, and that can cause some serious side effects. But hopefully we all have 46 chromosomes and we get 23 from our mom, 23 from our dad. Now, the 23rd pair, uh, every single chromosome codes for several hundred, hundreds of thousands of different genes. But the 23rd pair, the very last one in our DNA mapping, if you will, uh, what they call karyotype, is the sex chromosomes. Um, and, and this is what basically dictates whether you're male or female. So there's only two combinations. There's only two options being human being for the sex chromosomes. You can either be a male or female, and that's determined by having X chromosomes or Y chromosomes. So take a look at the female genotype or the female genetic makeup and it is an XX so basically and to then take a look at the male genetic makeup and it's XY so everybody on planet earth has an X chromosome 
every human being and that X chromosome is passed down from the mom okay so what I'm gonna what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna draw a little Punnett square here for you and we're gonna make you you're we're gonna go back in time and make you a, as a baby okay so what we have is we have mom can only give an X chromosome. So here's her two options. She has an X chromosome from her mom, and she actually has an X chromosome from her dad, from your mom's grandparents, your mom's parents, so your maternal grandparents. So dad is a little different. Your father has an X chromosome from your grandma on your dad's side and a Y chromosome from your grandpa on your dad's side. So that's his genetic makeup. When your mom and dad got together, here were the only options. Mom contributes an X chromosome in all scenarios. That's all she can give. But dad, it's split 50-50. So in certain situations, he can give an X chromosome and then in certain situations, he can give the Y chromosome. So out of these four possibilities, take a look at the, the outcomes. You have a 50% chance of being XX. There's two XX potentials. And you have a 50% chance of being XY. There's two XY potentials. So literally two out of four. And if you look at the human population from a world perspective, seven, I think we're... We're actually getting close to 8 billion people now on Earth, and it's pretty split. It's pretty close to 50-50, uh, maybe 51-49 or 52-48, but it's just probability. It's just odds. 50% uh, of us are pretty much males. 50% of us are pretty much females. So I say all that because mom can only give an X chromosome. So the Y chromosome is what dictates if you're a boy so dad is the one who actually chooses or not chooses but dad is the one that's responsible for the sex of the baby mom has no say in it now there there are some cool stuff about um if you want a boy or girl really really bad you can do some diet things you can do um all sorts of timing stuff it, it's interesting um a lot of it research kind of um frowns upon but some websites are are interesting just check it out if you, if you want to but i say all this because the y chromosome is what makes guys guys and that is what's going to trigger the testes development and therefore the testes development is going to trigger the testosterone eventually and that's what's going to lead to male characteristics down the road Versus if you are lacking the Y chromosome, you have an X from your mom and an X from your dad, you're not going to have that Y chromosome and therefore you're not going to develop testes. So let's move on to the next slide and I'll show you um, the timeline of how this all happens. Okay, so with these timelines, let's get our orientation in the right place. We have this five to six week timeline, seven to eight, eight to nine. What we're talking about is from the time of conception. So week zero or the very beginning of week one is at conception, basically when sperm meets egg. Okay, so for those first six weeks, all the way up to the end of week six, we are pretty much the same. We kind of have if you will, male and female parts, or we're kind of a um, hybrid, if you will. So we're sexually indifferent all the way up to week six. Um, you, you can't tell what, what we're going to be yet uh, unless you do some, some crazy, crazy genetic testing. So after week six, when we get to this week seven, week eight range, that is when the Y chromosome starts really kicking in and you can start developing male parts due to that Y chromosome. And then at, along that same time frame, just a little bit later from eight to nine weeks is when we are apparently absent of that Y chromosome 
and we can start to show female parts. But for the first month and a half of pregnancy, it, it's it's kind of all the same. And I'm going to summarize that on the last slide on this last page coming up and show you what I'm talking about. Okay. So a lot of crazy things going on uh, with this last slide, sexual differentiation, and you don't need to know all of the, the crazy, cool names for these things such as the, the Wolfian ducks and the – I don't even know how to say this. I'm going to guess Molarian ducks, um, but I do want to point out how this stuff works. So what we have with weeks five to six, once again, uh, we're kind of all the same. And believe it or not, you have both male and female parts. So what I want to look at, what I want to show you is take a look at this red tube right here and this blue tube right there, They're right next to each other. And then notice if you go down to the, the – on the guy side, so the guys over here, all this, notice the blue tube stays and this red tube right here starts breaking down and disintegrating. And then by the time we're born, it's, it's gone. Or by the time, really, second, third trimester, it's gone. Take a look at the female over here. We have the red things intact, but the blue things are starting to break down and disintegrate. And then there are no blue things towards the end. So this happens. And let me show you one more example. Notice in this picture with the and, uh, the inability to differentiate this purple structure right here, that's the gonad. Notice down here, this purple structure with the guy eventually becomes the testes. Same thing here though with the female, the purple structures become the ovaries. So. What this is showing you is a whole bunch of analogous structures. The stuff that's formed in the male is essentially a lot of times the same tissue that's formed in the female. So what was I showing you? What was I talking about with these tubes right here, with the red tube and the blue tube? Well, those are the tubes that connect the gonads to other parts of the reproductive anatomy. So remember, the fallopian tubes is what connects, in a way, indirectly, the ovaries to the uterus. The vas deferens is what connects the testes to the rest of the female, or excuse me, the male reproductive tract. So those two structures are analogous. You're actually conceived with somewhat of both of them. So guys, at one point, you can make the argument, yeah, you had fallopian tubes. Ladies, at one point, you actually had a vas deferens on both sides. But as your chromosomes dictated the way you were going to go, that changed. So what I want to talk about with the last couple minutes is I want to show you all the analogous structures in the male-female area and how these tissues are alike. So I just pointed out one of them to you. What I want you to know that the fallopian tubes in the female are the same tissues, basically, as, as we form. It's the same thing as the vas deferens. So FT fallopian tubes, VD vas deferens. Okay. Other things I want you to know. I mentioned this before. The male penis is the exact same tissue as the female clitoris. It's the same tissue. It's erectile tissue. It engorges with blood and it gets erect. And, and how, why do you think they're so similar? Well... Um, that we're, 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 when we're conceived, we have the same tissue, and they just migrate to different locations based on your genetics. Other structures. The male scrotum was that skin and connective tissue that enclosed the testes, right? It basically protects the testicles and also changes with temperature movements. So what's the skin enclosure of the uh, vulva and the vestibule, the labia majora. Remember, it's the lips on the outside. So we had labia majora and minora. The majora was the skin, the skin folds. So the scrotum is 
skin, labia majora, skin, same tissue. It's just protecting uh, those reproductive areas. And then, of course, last but not least, as we already said, um, the testes, I'll put over here, testes are synonymous with ovaries. You're going to form one or the other, or two of the other, right? Two ovaries, two testes. And it all depends on that Y chromosome. At week seven, or week six, week seven, if you have that Y chromosome, you're going to develop testes, vas deferens, penis tissue, scrotal tissue. If you do not have that Y chromosome, at week eight, week nine, you're going to start developing ovaries, fallopian tubes, clitoris, labia majora, and all the other structures we talked about. So make sure you know these relationships. Make sure you know that what structures of the male are analogous to the female and, of course, vice versa, female to male. All right, everyone. Great job. Uh, I, I, hope you, I hope you learned a lot. I hope you enjoyed the chapter. Um, I hope it didn't uh, make you uncomfortable or anything. I mean, this is life. This is biology. So uh, let your instructor know if you have any questions, and I will see you next time. Take care and study well.